this morning. I want if you would this morning as we're getting ready to start into the Word of God, I want you to look into the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 10. I'm going to read down to about verse 18. I pray that all of you had a great week so far, and I'm looking forward to a great day today. Uh, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. Man, I'm excited about what God is doing. Amen. And uh, pray that God do something mighty in our lives today. Uh, continue to pray for the ones that are out sick. I ask you not only to just randomly mention it uh, once every three or four days, but continue to pray for them daily. Uh, continue to pray for Miss Sonia. Lift her up. There was many more that was made mention here this morning. I want you to, that their names were called out. I want you to lift them up. In prayer uh, in the book of Ephesians before we get started I want to uh, start with a prayer this morning just ask for God's blessings here upon this word today father we thank you again for this opportunity and for this time to assemble together as a corporate body Lord to magnify and lift up the name of Jesus we thank you Lord for your grace your uh, unmerited favor of God that you have bestowed upon our life. And Lord, as we open your word up today, begin to read it, begin to study it, and begin to preach it, Lord. We ask God for your anointing, Lord, to rest upon us. We pray, God, for ones that have maybe been held captive. Uh, God, for the ones who need to be set free. The God, for the ones who don't know you as Lord and Savior of their life. May the Holy Spirit Move in this place this morning and minister, Lord, to every need. That things that have been done in darkness, Lord, that may they be brought to light in, into the heart of the believer. We thank you, Lord, today. We come, Lord, with a total reliance upon the Holy Spirit to move in here this morning. Father, we thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, Amen. I want to look this morning, I want to speak to you uh, for a few minutes this morning because one of the things I think that I shared when I first came here and maybe a couple messages, my desire is to see you as a believer live victoriously. One of the things I constantly see is just defeat. And I think this morning I want to preach to you a message that I've entitled Exposing the Tactics of the Adversary how he begins to attack our lives and the things that we're going through and the things that we're dealing with and a lot of things just in the way or the, the attitude that we respond, how it has begun to open doors up that the adversary has stuck his foot in. I, I thought about it this morning, came coming here, and I thought about how sometimes when you're in a rush to get to somewhere and maybe the door's about to close and you stick your foot in it just to catch it. You catch it just in time that the door does not close in which it now it gives you access that you're able to ease in. And I thought so many times how the devil has stuck his foot inside the door. Because a lot of times these doors are doors that we have opened. And we have given him access into our lives, into our families, and it has caused chaos. And we wonder where all this is coming from, how, why my life is absent of peace, why don't I have peace in my life? Why is there so much chaos that's going on in my life? In the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, it addresses some of this. And I want to think that he gives a strict or really try to grab our attention at the, the seriousness of what is taking place in our life. If you don't think that there is an adversary, look around. You can just look at homes, how they're being destroyed. You can just look around in our communities, how they're being destroyed. We can just look into sometimes our own personal life or, or to our kids' life and just see how their lives are being destroyed or sometimes we're just absent from the peace of God. What is taking place? In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6 and in verse 10, Paul writes this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Not part of it, but put on the whole armor. 
that ye may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes or the methods of the devil. I know you've probably heard about this guy somewhere along the way. And I want you to understand, don't you underestimate him because he's out to get you. He's out to rob you of life that God has placed into you. He's out to steal you of the very joy of life and the peace that is upon us. This is what he is out to do. And he says that he has schemes, he has methods of doing this. And, and I want to tell you, a lot of times we're playing right into his hands and the things and the way that we live our life. He says, so put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day. And having done all to stand, Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. And in verse 18, we're going to end with this. And he says, and praying always with all prayer. Let me say it one more time. Praying always with all prayer. And supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. I want to just lay something down before I get very deep in, into this. Because it makes mention that we have an adversary. First Peter talks about it, that we have an adversary, and Peter refers to him as the devil. The adversary is an opponent. It is our enemy. He's not your friend. Let me say it one more time. No matter how, how much you think it looks good, he's not your friend. He is an adversary of yours, and he is a very opponent of of who, what God is wanting to do in your life. Peter talked to him and spoke to him about that he is as, as a roaring lion. He did not say he was a lion. He says he's as a roaring lion. In other words, he comes to intimidate you, to instill fear, to back you into a corner that you will not move. But how many of you know this morning that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind? His strategy, his, method, his methods are deceit, are, are trickery and craftiness. And he also works through, I want you to grab a hold of this, and you may just want to write this down because you don't need to forget this because this is a key component. Not only does he work through deception and trickery and craftiness, but he also works through the weakness of the lust of the flesh. A matter of fact, a lot of times the way he got access into our lives was because we opened a door for him. Hello, somebody. You opened a door and didn't even realize it because giving in to the lust of the flesh. He works through thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. You ever had time your mind just began to run wild and begin to think about old crazy stuff that you maybe, hey, I, I would like to go do that. It was just thoughts, ideas, and suggestions of him trying to persuade you to move from the position that you're in. I like what John says about him in John chapter 10. Uh, John chapter 10 gives a reference to him as someone who is trying to get access to the flock as a shepherd. This is what John says about him. He said he's trying to get access. He did not come in the gate. He tried to work his way in like a thief. And, and we understand this, but he's actually just there as a thief and he's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This is what he does. His grand objective is to counteract the good that God desires to do, especially to draw the soul of men from embracing salvation 
through Jesus Christ. This is his ultimate objection, his ultimate job. There is a constant struggle against this. Probably if you have lived in this world, you can find out that, man, there are some things that's going on and there's some things that you're fighting with. There's, there's a constant struggle against corruption of the flesh and the imposing temptation of Satan. I want to look just for a few minutes and I want to cover something that's probably going to be really, really touchy, so hang on. Are y'all with me? Don't let me lose you. I want you to stay connected with me this morning because this is very, very important. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you or make you free. I want to look first of all at two little, two little things before I get started because this is the very foundation of the things I think that Satan is working through and how he's working. I want to look first of all at flesh and Satan. Because we're doing a lot of things that's going on in our life. And we always say, you hear this predominantly a lot, that Satan made me do this. I wanted to close the fact out today that Satan did not make you do anything. He might have enticed you. He might have brought trickery. He might have brought deception to lead you to do something. But he did not make you do anything. I would like to look at it from this manner. We like to blame everything on him, but the truth is and we, could not, we could not bring the flesh under submission to the Spirit. Oh, hang on with me. When we get down to the very, very base of it, when we look down and say, how did all this start? How did you get to where you're at? How did you get into the mess that you're in? It's all going to lead back to one factor that we was not walking in the Spirit, but we was walking in the flesh. We find out now that flesh now has begun to have control of our life and we begin to make decisions based upon this. You're going to find out when you're submissive to the Holy Spirit, your certain things do not happen. Oh, am I in the right house? I said when we find ourselves submissive to the Holy Spirit, there's just certain things that does not happen. I made a comment one time, and I still stand behind this. I'm going to get a time out right here. Because I, I use this story all the time, and I, I'll make reference of it. And uh, I don't know, can we use the word, I know we're in the church, but I'm going to use the word juke joint. Uh, probably everybody here has probably heard this sometime or another. And every time that we pass one or see something, and somebody, I say that's always a good place to get shot. Mm. And I said, yeah, I may get shot, but it won't be there. And somebody says, Pastor, you don't know that you won't get shot. I said, I can tell you, I don't know that I won't, but it won't be there. Because the reason I'm sharing this story, when I put myself in certain situations, it opens up the door for certain possibilities. Oh, am I in the right house this morning? Don't let me preach over your head. I done made it plain. Because we find ours, when we put ourselves in certain positions, we're going to find out then that we're subject to certain things beginning to happen in our lives. And so this is how the Satan just trying to pull you into a place that you ought not to be. And the only way that you're going to be able to get there is when you begin to be dismissive or being or rebellious to the Spirit of God and submissive to the flesh. Turn with me to the book of, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 8 just one second. Because I want to, we're going to look at something here in just a second. In the book of Romans in chapter 8, there's something that he makes very, very plain. Book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. For to be carnally minded is there. The word carnal minded is non-spiritual. So it's not to be spiritually minded. It's the very opposite of being spiritually minded. So he says here to be carnally minded is what? Is death. I don't know about you, but I'm not wanting to go in that direction. Amen. I don't want my life to just be filled with stuff that's dying. I want life to come out of who I am. But he also says he did not stop there because wherever there is a cause, he also gives a cure. 
You can always find Jesus coming through, and he'll tell you that these things will cause this, but he also tells you that this will cause life. And he says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Is life and peace. Is it up on the board with me? Can y'all see it? To be spiritually minded is life and what? And peace. In the book of Galatians, I want to look one more one more spot right here. Because this is very interesting. In the book of Galatians, in chapter 6 and verse 8. We'll just start with verse 7, if that's good with y'all. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also, what? Reap. Look at verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. Hmm. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So you do have a choice. You have a choice to what you're sowing to. I continue to make this comment. I'm big on this, that whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It is a natural principle that every, probably every one of us in this house have been accustomed to and probably believe that you know that when you plant a certain type seed in the ground that that, that certain fruit or that certain vegetable is going to come off of it. It's going to produce what it has planted. The Bible says that we, re, that we reproduce after our own kind. That's in the book of Genesis. He just set some spiritual principles down. These same spiritual principles are alive and well today. And so if you do not like what you're reaping, it's, not, it's affected by what you're planting. It's the, I mean, some of this, it's the results of what we have planted. Amen? So if you, don't, if you want a different harvest, you must plant a different seed. Is anybody with me? Miss Betty's pretty good with farming. She's brought me some okra and some snap beans. She got them from somewhere. But I want to I, I wanna tell you this. When, when you plant something, if you wanted okra, what did you do? You planted okra seed. If you want apples, you plant apple seeds. We all understand this. Why is it that when it comes to the spiritual things, all of a sudden that we're floored by what is taking place in our life when we have sent it planted seeds according to the flesh mm. why is it that we were shocked why was it that when it began to come up we find out that it was beginning to take peace and joy and still and drain the very life out of us when we planted things to the flesh because the bible said that they that sow to the flesh mm, shall of the flesh reap what corruption but they that sow the spirit shall reap life are y'all with me Am I connecting here? I'm saying this. I'm not saying that there are some, not some, man, there's some deep spiritual battles that we go through. But the majority of the spiritual battles, grab a hold of this. The majority of the spiritual battles that you're going through is a result of a door you open. Whew. Man. I got to look then. I said, are the results of a door that you opened? you telling me I let him in. I said, I'm not telling you done it intentionally, but you opened the door. You opened this door through the lust of the flesh. This is how he works. Did you ever read the story in the book of Genesis how he got a hold of Eve? He placed something before her that grabbed the attention of her eyes. Do you see where I'm going with this? And you know what else he did begin to do? He began to question everything that God had told them. Did God say this? Did God really say this? Did God really mean this? You're telling me that he told you the day that you eat of this, you're going to die? How dare that would be able to happen. He knows that the day that you eat this, you're going to begin to be like him. And all of a sudden now, do you see how he works through craftiness, deceitfulness? And all of a sudden now, he works through the lust of the flesh, or we, we would call it this, 
the weakness of the flesh. And all of a sudden, he's whispering in her ear. Do you know what that whispering was for? To disconnect her from the source of life. Oh, you're not with me. It was to disconnect her from the source. If you, it, I want to tell you, I want to just stop right here just once. Can I get another time out? I, I've sit around sometimes, and y- y'all are like this. I, y'all sit around sometimes and get on social media in the afternoons and sort of browse around, stroll around. And I, I, I see people on the street, and they say, oh, Pastor, I need your prayers. Pastor, I need your help. My life is a mess. I'm like, you didn't have to tell me. You didn't have to tell me your life's a mess. You didn't have to tell me you had no peace. You, my life is, you, Pastor, you won't believe what I, I would believe it. Tell me. I already know what you're doing. Because you have put everything out here and you're now entertaining the desires of the flesh, what did you expect to happen? You open up a door and you said, hey, this house is open. Come on, somebody. Then all of a sudden, when when he walks in and brings destruction, how did this happen? There's a lot of people sitting around saying, I know how it happened. You opened the door. You let him in. To the desires or the weakness of our flesh. There's a few keys to victorious life. You don't want to miss this. It's not something complicated. As the boys used to say at school, it's not really that deep. It's just certain keys and certain principles. I want to think that I made this comment several times and grab a hold to this. You cannot expect the blessings of God when you have violated the principles. Have y'all heard me say that before? I hope that you grabbed it. If you didn't, you, I hope you get it this time. Run it down. You cannot expect the blessings of God when you have violated the principles of God. So there's a few keys to living victoriously. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know about you, I want to live victoriously. And when I mean living victoriously, I want to live the life that God has for me. A life of peace, a life of joy, a life of victory, a life of spiritual power. This is what I want. I want, it, I want to live a life of influence on my kids. That it influences them in the direction that they're beginning to go in life. The number one key that I personally think that is constantly ignored. I say this word constantly. It is just constantly ignored. That gives Satan access is just simply disobedience to the word of God. Wow. Just simply, it's not rocket science. It's just simply being obedient to that which he has spoken. When you go back, you see this principle in the garden. You can learn a lot from just the first one, two chapters of the book of Genesis. And when you find out how Satan began to get access into the life of Adam and Eve, you're going to find out that his tactics have not changed today. He's still using the same lures. He's still using the same tactic. He's still being deceptive. So, you know what? And I've been around some people that, that's, I I used the word deep while ago, far out. (laughs) Anybody know what I mean? (laughs) That they far out. (laughs) And 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 they would say, Pastor, you won't believe Satan. You won't believe what Satan has done doing in my life. I said, quit doing this. Quit this. I said, he he brings temptation, but the ultimate decision is yours whether you're going to be obedient or disobedient to the word that God has spoken. The devil's all in my life. He got that because you opened a door. Help me here this morning. So when you look at the Adam and Eve, she had a choice. Am I obedient to what God says or am I going to listen to what he is saying? And every one of us are faced with this same situation every day, 
day in and day out or we're going to be obedient to what God has said or we're going to listen to our adversary, our opponent, the one who is out to steal, kill, and to destroy. I know he didn't tell you that. He told you that life was going to be better. I've got a better roses for you. But I'm telling you today, he is the father of all lies and he comes to steal the very life out of us. Victory is in obedience to the word. I don't know if I give John this morning but this, but I've got to go to this. In the book of Matthew, very interesting, very good story here. The book of Matthew, there's a sermon on the mount. Anybody ever heard Jesus talk about this, preach on this? A couple of chapters have been dedicated to this. And on the sermon on the mount that Jesus is speaking, speaking here and in Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 24 through 27 Jesus gives a very powerful story or very powerful illustration and so here he begins to talk about and some of you have probably recognized this he says wherefore therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them I will liken unto him as a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew in the, and beat upon the house, and it fell what? Not. For it was what? It was founded upon a rock. And he says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to the foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Let me show this right here. The stability of the house came through obedience from that which had been spoken to the builder. Mm. I said the stability of the house came through obedience from that which was spoken from the architect to the builder. The, the, the builder just simply was going by what the architect said. You can see where the house that was built upon the rock took an attack. You're not a, we're not exempt from attacks. I'm not saying that you're not going to be attacked. I'm not saying that man sometimes hell just won't over, try to overtake your home. Because we probably have all experienced that somewhere along the line. But what I'm telling you, that if you continue to be obedient unto the Word of God, it may endure. It may have to endure. The, the storm may be upon the house. It, the wind may blow upon the house. But the reason that the storm did not prevail upon the house was because the builder had been obedient unto the architect. Can I get, does anybody believe that the Word of God is true this morning and that there's power in it? Because once we believe, I know that, man, we'll get in church, we'll shout the preacher down, that we, but if you believe it now and if you believe that the Word of God is true, you will find yourself being obedient unto that which He's spoken to you. And when you, find, when you start to do that, you're going to find out that there's some doors that have been opened and starting to be closed. And you're going to find out that peace and joy and life is starting to be produced out of your life because you're simply obedient unto that which He's spoken to you. Did I make sense there? The strength of the believer. One more point. The strength of the believer is in the Lord. You with me? He, he makes mention that we're to be strong in the Lord, in the Lord's power, and in the Lord's might. Victory is only found in the... He is the very source of the believer's strength and the believer's victory. We're talking about Jesus Christ here. The Bible says that He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. We find out that in Him is truth. Jesus said, I am the truth and I am the life. In John 15 and 5, Jesus said, without me, you can do absolutely nothing. Do you see now why Satan is trying to disconnect you from the power source? 
the very source of your power, the very source of life. In Jesus, you are victorious, and in Him, and in Him alone. The strategy of the adversary is to disconnect you. To disconnect you from life, to dis disconnect you from peace, disconnect you from power, disconnect you from the truth, disconnect you from the word, disconnect you from the spiritual or the spiritual influence. He's, he's trying to disconnect you from the place that you're being spiritually fed. He's trying to disconnect you from Jesus, the very source of life, the very source of peace, and the very source of power. This is the whole setup. The whole setup was to disconnect you from that which was bringing this into your life. And Jesus said, you can be nothing if you're not connected to me. One last point. Am I good? Because he goes into detail. I'm not going to go into all this. Because he goes into detail about clothing yourself with armor. And I think this is very, very important. Because there's some things that he's trying to disconnect. He's some things that he's really trying to do here. And you're going to find out. I may mention earlier, man, he, he's always trying to disconnect you. You ever notice how it's harder on Sundays when you maybe you're going to go to worship to get to worship service always hard to get to here it ain't near as hard to get, I mean it's not as near physically as hard to get here to church as it is to work we move the time back to 1030 some churches have it at 11 but somehow or another we struggle with this tomorrow morning we won't struggle we got to be to work at 6 why is that? There's a lot of things, but I think that when it comes down to it, is there was an attempt to disconnect you. To disconnect. You ever notice? I'm a, I want to challenge you. have a problem sleeping at night? Get the Bible and go to reading it. And you know what? You're just going to read yourself right on to sleep. While we was watching our favorite sports thing, we stayed up until 10 o'clock and watched it. What, what was that? It was a scheme to disconnect. See, watching that TV or reading uh, whatever magazine, it wasn't having spiritual influence. So there was really no need for him to attack you in that area. Let him read it. But when you begin to try to find yourself, hey, you know what? I need to go to church today because I need some spiritual influence in my life. And you swore up and down. You set that alarm clock, but it didn't go off. For six days, you got up and didn't ever have a headache, but you got up this morning and had one. I don't know why the kids act. I'm going to say this. I'll be talking about my own kids when they was it. I don't know why they act so crazy on Sunday mornings. <laughs> but there's pandemonium in my house here on Sunday mornings. Me and my wife got along really good for six days. And all of a sudden, them crazy kids come through here hollering, running like a, just wild Indians. And all of a sudden now, I'm hollering to kids. She's hollering at me, and there's chaos inside the house. Well, some of y'all been there, some of y'all haven't. <laughs> what did it happen today? Trying to disconnect you trying to disconnect go to praying you're going to find yourself all of a sudden especially if you wait too late at night you're reading the Bible you're praying all of a sudden man I'm getting sleepy it's disconnecting you are you am I making sense here I'm going to close with that last point somebody's just still waiting on it and so he says this, I'm going to close with this, because I think it's very, very important, because one of the things that we have been attacked with in this generation is he says to put on, gird yourself with truth. Gird yourself with truth. 
Because if Satan can disconnect you from the truth, I'm going to go ahead and be honest with you, he's got you. And somebody says, what is truth? What is it? And years ago they said, oh, there's no such thing as absolute truth. What's true for you might not be true for me. I want to tell you there's absolute truth, and absolute truth is wound up or bound up in a man by the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said he was truth, and he was life. Why has there been such an attack upon this? If you don't know the truth, you have opened yourself up to deception. If you do not know the truth, you have opened yourself up to the very weapon that Satan loves to use, which is deception. He stuck his foot in the door. How did he get in? You left a crack in the door. And I want to tell you this morning, as a mom, as a dad, a pastor, to my kids, we got to continue to walk in truth if we're to walk in victory. If you want to walk in victory, go to walking in truth. Amen? And you're going to find this out. You're going to find out that, man, something's starting to happen in your life, that God's starting to do mighty things. Man, what happened? You just closed the door to the adversary that he was trying to get in. Amen? I want you to stand your feet this morning.